Hello and welcome to today's event, Storytelling in Project Management. My name is Greg Kraftcheck and I am your host for today. I'm very excited to have you here. We've got some really fun speakers coming up with you today. But the first thing I need to tell you about is Mentimeter. You can probably see somewhere on the screen, up there or up there maybe, there's a link to Mentimeter and a code. So what I want you to do is uh, click, click, click that link. Uh, there we go. Great. Uh, I think everyone can see me. Click that link and tell us where you're from. So this is our second storytelling event from the Thames Valley. The first we ran back in January 2020 during COVID. We had fantastic reviews then. 9.4 out of 10 as a net promoter score. I'm really excited to bring this format back to you today. Why storytelling? Well, we live in a world where there's an ever-increasing need to present data to people. There's an ever-increasing increasing level of stakeholder complexity. There's change upon change upon change happening. And we believe storytelling is a great tool to cut through all of that. So we've got three speakers coming up today, or well, two actually. Uh, I'll explain in a second. We've got Steve Walters, who's going to be talking to us about learning and nuclear robotics. Cool game on risk and some really fun stories. Our third speaker, Laura, unfortunately has COVID today, so she's really up against it and can't make it, but we've got some other stuff to talk to you about. Uh, so re really, uh, really fun session. We'll be finishing today at uh, 12, 12, 12, 45. So uh, we'll uh, let you all get away for some lunch. Right, let's look at some of the results coming in. I can see we've got uh, 22, 23 people signing up at the moment. Uh, there's way to double that on the line. So if you haven't already, please open the new tab on your web browser or pick up your phone, go to menti.com, type in that number. Alternatively, there is a link in the chat. We will be using Menti throughout. And if you want to raise any questions at any point, you can do. So please go ahead, log in, raise questions, upload others, and there'll be a Q&A session at the end. Okay, I'm hoping that everyone's joined us. So for those that have just started, again, hello and welcome. Um, my, uh, my quick assessment of where you're all joining us from, it's great to see we've got some people from the Thames Valley, so Oxford there, Milton Keynes, fantastic. I'm volunteering with the Thames Valley branch, that's fantastic to see. I can also see Buzz along there, that's a great name. I, I'm guessing Leighton is missing. Uh, Saffron Warden, lovely, Cranfield, Newcastle, hello from up north. I used to say that was a bit colder up there, but not anymore. And uh, Sheffield, North Somerset, that's closer to my home. Great to see you all, and thank you everyone for joining today. So to start, hello again for everyone that's just joined. My name is Greg Kraftcheck. I'm a volunteer with the Thames Valley branch. I've been for about six years now, and I'm also a chartered project manager with the APM. I'll be your host today. I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey of storytelling and project management today. We're going to start with Steve Walters joining at 10 past 12. You've got me for a few minutes until then. Uh, we were going to have Laura Hartley, uh, but unfortunately she's got COVID and she sends her apologies. Um, but we do have some potential improv there that I've been working on this morning. Uh, so we've got a few options for how today is going to go. So if none of you have been to an improv play before, this is my interpretation. We'll see how that goes. And then Paul Game uh, is going to be giving us his talk on risk management. And please do stick with us. Uh, I've got a few key notices for you and uh, some upcoming events. Before then, there'll be a bit of a Q&A and after party. Um, we'll be done probably with the presentations up to 12.30, 12.40. And we'll use the rest of the time for Q&A as needed. If you're wondering why you're here, well, you've signed up to project management storytelling. And if that conjures images of a fireside chat, you're getting close to what we're going to be covering today. If it conjures images of being read a story as a young child, you're really getting there. But if it conjures images of the last WhatsApp message you sent of a cat gif, uh, I'm sorry to tell you way off the mark, but you're going to have some good learning today. So welcome everyone. I'm now going to talk to you about why storytelling. That's one of the key parts for us to impart today. Two sides of the coin for this event. One is we hope you learn a bit about storytelling. 
and from our techniques that we're using. And the other is to learn from some great speakers. But why storytelling? Well, um, I think I think we all we are all we're all natural storytellers, and I think storytelling is something that's increasingly important to us all. And I'm going to tell you why. We're all having to sell data more. We're working with increasingly rich stakeholder groups, and we're dealing with change upon change upon change. And we need to connect and push through all that to connect with people to sell a story. Storytelling is a great tool for engaging stakeholders. You can cut through all of that. And with storytelling, you can engage stakeholders like never before. So what is storytelling? Well, we could go all the way back to Aristotle. 2,300 years ago, this was being debated and considered. Every story should have a beginning, middle and end. You may have heard of that. Well, it came from Aristotle. What makes a really great story? It's an art, not a science, but there are lots of techniques you can use. You can craft your story. Some great ones, I'll throw a few in. Why don't we think about um, the hero's journey? Think about Shrek. Think about um, Hercules. They go on their journey. They go up and they go down. And there's a big ending with an adversary who they overcome. Or maybe a false start. You're straight into uh, straight into the film. Maybe something's happening, and then bam, completely change direction. How does that engage people? Or maybe into the middle, opening scene: a galactic star destroyer is coming through, chasing a small Tie Fighter. Lasers going everywhere. You're right in the middle of the action. Isn't that a lovely way to start a story? Or how about the petal format, where you use multiple different stories converging on a common point to show how you came up with your theory. Cloud Atlas is a great example of that. You've seen that film in that book. Or my favourite technique is the spark lines. So you take people from a journey of where they are now to where you want them to be, where they are now to where you want them to be, where they are now to where you want them to be, and then you give them the solution. Steve Jobs was excellent. At doing that. So that's almost it from me, but just one more thing. Don't forget the presentation. A story structure is fantastic, but without a good presenter and without good presenter aid, i.e. PowerPoint, you're not going to get the whole story across. So for me, closing out my introduction, I want you all to challenge yourself today, to get the most out of today's session. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to give you three tips that I think you should be considering throughout. The first is think about the story structure. Did it have a beginning, middle and end? Did it take you on a roller coaster? Did it work for you? The second is look. Look at what the presenter's doing. Look at the presentation. Were there too many words? Good use of imagery. Could do some contrast. Did it work for you? And third, listen. Listen to the way the presenter is speaking. Listen to their pitch. Listen to the pace. Listen to filler words. Um, ah. And most of all, listen for space, pauses. Use all of that to get the maximum benefit from today. You're going to learn about storytelling, I hope, reflect on some practices, and hear from some great speakers. Okay, closing out my introduction, let's get you moving towards meeting the speakers for today. Um, I've got one more thing to show you, that's the presentation structure. I've got a bit of ground on theory and ideas, and we were mulling around. How do you make a presentation format fun? Well, we came up with this noddy structure. So the presentation should be short, that makes it more engaging, six to eight minutes. They shouldn't be any more than 30 seconds long, but they can be shorter. That's going to create pace and interest. We want people to present with image primacy, so try to use images more than words. If you like this format, feel free to plagiarise it and make it your own. It's our first time doing this, feedback is welcome. So I'm going to move now to um, start introducing our first speaker of today. 
So, Steve, in the background, if you could get your presentation ready, that would be fantastic. So, Steve is a retired, I must add, or I'm not quite sure if that is the truth sometimes, principal consultant with the UK National Laboratory. He's a visiting academic. He is a higher education volunteer with the APN and Thames Valley Branch. I had the pleasure of knowing Steve for six years now. He's also a volunteer with the APM on the Stakeholder Engagement Focus Group. And he's going to talk to us today, today about the, the value of prior learning. And I'm hoping there's a bit there about nuclear robotics as well. Steve, welcome. If you'd like to come on screen and join me. Hello. Can you hear me, Craig? Hello, Steve. I can. I can hear you. I can see your screen, Steve, and it's all looking good. Steve, welcome. It's great okay. to have you here today. So Steve, you, you've, done plenty, you've done plenty of talks and getting in presentations in your life, particularly in the academic field. So I'm guessing none of this is new to you, but it's a slightly different format that you and I have cooked up for this one. So I'm really, really keen sure. to see what you've come up with. And we'll have a chat about it afterwards. So Steve, you're up first. Well, um, I can see your screen. Okay. And if you're ready to go, Steve, the floor is yours. I'm, I'm ready to go. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, what I've got to do is start sharing screen uh, or showing my, uh, my presentation. I can, um, I can see your screen at the moment, Steve, your presentation. It's full screen for me. It's looking good. Okay. So somebody's done that in the background. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so let's start. You know, it's a, it's a funny old world. Sometimes you go through a phase of your career and when it's over, you think, well, that's never going to come around again, but it does. And, and in the world of projects, the benefit of cross-cutting multidisciplinary learning can be profound. So here's a real life case study, and it happened to me this year. Okay, a long time ago, in, in a much earlier phase of my career, I was employed at the UK government-owned research complex at Harwell, run by the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Now, those were exciting times. All kinds of space-related research was happening. And in particular, the NASA Space Shuttle program was just getting going, and I had the fun of being involved with it. You see, out in space, there's a lot of radiation flying around, just a sort of specialist topic for an atomic scientist to grapple with. There's the solar wind, a mixture of photons and protons and electrons. There's cosmic rays and trapped radiation belts. It's a complicated radiation field that can harm humans and cause equipment to fail. This diagram just shows the way the solar wind is deflected by the Earth's magnetosphere. And that's just part of the story. Then there's the trapped radiation belts, usually referred to as the Van Allen belts, which are zones of magnetically trapped electrons or beta rays. And these vary in intensity and distance as shown in this schematic. Back in the 1960s, the Apollo moon landing program used to launch rockets at a fairly high inclination, not equatorial. So the crew didn't have to fly straight for the worst part of this, which meant at least it was as mitigated as it could be. One of the coolest things I got involved with was the Long Duration Exposure Facility, or LDEF as it was called. This satellite was launched and retrieved by Space Shuttle, but which spent several years alone orbiting the Earth and being exposed to this harsh environment. In this picture, you can see the LDF as it's being retrieved by the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1990, having been placed in orbit in 1985. The LDF had numerous experimental panels all over its surface, and after retrieval, these were returned to the lab for examination. And this taught us a lot about how materials and electronic systems behaved in the long term in such radiation fields. I managed to secure some components for tests at Harwell, particularly regarding electrostatic or beta radiation buildup on panel materials commonly used as thermal insulation in spacecraft. So, 
Fast forward a few decades. Technology's moved on, and now we see the rise of the robots. And this picture just shows a modern car factory. In fact, robots have been around for a few decades since the 1990s. But it's from the 2010s onwards that the computing power we need to make robots work effectively and in situ has really been available. In the world of the nuclear industry, this is great news. We can get robots to do things where we wouldn't really want to send a human to do work that is dull and repetitive, dirty and sometimes dangerous. Obviously, radiation fields are one of the problems. In this picture, we see a snake arm robot, that's the thing in the middle, equipped with a laser cutting head, cutting up a piece of large steel pipe, just the sort of task that's likely to arise in nuclear decommissioning. And this picture shows some robots sorting dummy radioactive waste off a table where it's been dumped, uh, just setting, uh, prior to be, being deployed in active service at Sellafield. These robots would have to work for up to 10 years in a fairly hostile radiation environment. And I got involved in assessing the likely lifetime and life limiting effects of these systems. Then there was Fukushima. By that time, about 2010, robots were just about good enough to have the computing and sensing power on board to make them useful. And this image is of a robot being lowered into a water channel so it could progress into the flooded reactor internals and reconnoiter the damage caused inside the reactor core. Unfortunately, it didn't get very far. The radiation field uh, tried the electronics, to use the words in the newspaper reports, just to emphasize the difficulties. This picture is of a later robot that did manage to swim inside a damaged Fukushima reactor. In fact, it surpassed the design requirements, and after its Fukushima deployment was retrieved and reused to look at spent nuclear fuel in storage ponds at Sellafield. It just goes to show how, over the space of a couple of years, the radiation tolerance technology had come on and improved. But still, these things do have a clear and finite lifespan. So now we come up to date and move full circle. In the past couple of years, the scientific progress on future AI and robotics in space, known as FAIR space, has been consolidated through a UK academic hub, which operated from 2017 to 2022. Actually, the UK is already a world leader in the preparation of microsatellites that can launch as extra payload in some other major launch opportunity. And earlier this year, I was invited to be an expert panelist in the Fair Space Hub Closeout Symposium. Now, the UK government is poised to place significant investment in the world of in-orbit servicing and manufacture, IOSM. Off-planet, in microgravity, we can make things that simply can't be made on Earth. And instead of having satellites that wear out and become redundant, what if we could repair and service them and get much more sustainable value out of our launch weight investment? But of course, the manufacturing and service engineer jobs will all go to robots. There probably won't be a human in sight on these orbiting factories. In turn, the robots will need to be able to last the course, which in space means standing up to the radiation environment. A key need now is for scientists to really understand the space environment and its radiation effects on materials and systems. It's what, what an opportunity to pass on past learning in a new project delivery context. Which leads me to my closing proposal, the, the elephant perspective. You, you know the old saying that an elephant never forgets. And that maxim should be a guide in project management. One of the benefits of lifelong learning and memory is the way that projects can draw on past experience in quite possibly an unrelated field. Cross-cutting information and expertise valid in more than one project in Maine. Now that's priceless. Never forget it. And thank you for listening to me. Greg, back to you.
Fantastic. Hi, Steve. That, that was a really, really fun talk. And uh, we, we we got some really, really good set. Everyone on the call, there's 82 of us, by the way, I think, plus today. Um, so, Steve, really good audience there. And I, I was just really drawn in by your visuals. Um, so, uh, you yeah, written really well done there. And just for everyone else on the call, um, before we let Steve go, I would like to um, just invite you to tell us what were your takeaways from Steve's talk. So, you'll see... Um, there's on your phone now or in that Menti tab, you just put the opportunity to a bit of reflection. So I want you to try and embed some of the learning maybe that you took from the presentation or from the content. So what did you take away from Steve's talk? Steve, back to you. Um, that was that was a really, really excellent talk and you're clearly a very experienced uh, speaker and with some lovely um, ed- imagery and great ending there. I, I really zoned in on the ending in the elephant. Um, we did actually lose you. Your audio went for just a second there. Um, so I, th- I think your, your closing point was um, you know, e- experience is, is really important. But maybe could you just repeat to us that closing point around the elephant? We did lose you for a few seconds at the beginning of that last sure, time. Sure. Uh, I, I, I'll just re, uh, re, re- go through the, the, the wording for that last fun slide. The elephant perspective. You know that uh, the old saying that an elephant never forgets, and that that makes yes, contribute to yes. in project management. Because one of the benefits of uh, lifelong learning and memory is the way that projects can draw on past experience in quite possibly an unrelated field. Because cross-cutting information is valid in more than one project domain. That's priceless. Don't forget it. Thank you, Steve. That's something I inherently feel myself, but great to hear from some of your experience. So, um, Steve, I'm just going to quickly share my screen now once more. We just have some feedback. So uh, I'm going to pick out on a few few points, Steve. So um, some of the takeaways, uh, rapid deployment in robotics driven by otherwise disastrous events. Uh, fascinating, Steve. Many thanks. Um, here we go. Here's a nice one. Don't be afraid to use learning from other industries. All learning should be remembered. Absolutely. Because I, I, I know that stuff from the space industry into the nuclear decommissioning industry and back out to the space industry again. Fantastic, Steve. Well, Steve, I'm going to have to um, move on. I could talk to you all day about this, um, as I'm sure many of us would like to, but we do do have an agenda to get through. So, Steve, I'm going to have to say thank you very much again, and uh, yeah, very much appreciate it on behalf of us all. Thanks, Steve. Okay, Okay, I'm going to go silent and off screen. Thank you, Steve. Great. Okay. Well, back to our presentation, everyone. Um, Laura, unfortunately, can't be with us today. She has come down with COVID, but it's really not that well at all. Uh, I think she's going to be okay. I'm guessing she's jabbed, but she does send her apologies. So I've got another question for you. We're meant to have Laura now, but I've got I've got some options for you. Um, you've got three. So one is I'm I, I can actually do a, a talk which is similar. Uh, that I did quite recently, if you're interested. It's King Louis the Fourteenth of France and what lessons can we learn in a similar format? Or I've got some slides on storytelling theory and I want to have a bit of discussion with you two way about how to construct a story or how we do a presentation. So probably about five minutes on that. Or if I've been talking too much and you thought you'd have peak Greg and you want to move on to something else, we can go straight to Paul. So you should see that on the screen now, um, and you've got the link in the chat, you've got the code up there. So I'm going to give you all, I don't know, 20 seconds. So again, your options are King Louis the 14th, what can we learn? Greg doing, me doing an impromptu talk I've not prepared for, but it's a fun one. Uh, storytelling theory and application, or uh, enough of me, and on to the next topic, risk. Okay, we've got 20 votes of 78 people who are here. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, we are going to be using Mentimeter a bit today. So if you haven't already, go to your phone, mentor.com, and type that one. Okay, let's see where we've got to. Uh, okay, King Louis the Fourteenth is coming out on top. Um, looks like we've got 27 in. No more coming through. Oh, you're sadistic. Oh, I, I haven't prepared this. Okay, here we go. I think that's the answer. King Louis the Fourteenth, and what lessons we can learn from him. Uh, I think I'm sharing the wrong screen here, so uh, I'm going to try switching now to the other screen. Um, and you should now be able to see um, 
King King the, uh, the slides for King Louis the Fourteenth. Rob, if that's not coming through clearly, please let me know. Okay, uh, I'm going to start. How do you know when your project has really gone sideways? Answer: pitchforks, cannons, death, and we start and end our story in 1789 with the Women's March to Versailles. Some of you may be familiar with this story already. Um, here we go. Uh, so we, we we start us we finish our story in 1793 with King Louis the Sixteenth, and unfortunately things didn't end well for him. As you can see, the guillotine, the French Revolution, it was largely attributed back to the exuberance of his predecessor. And this is a story about King Louis XIV of France, Versailles, and how not to lose your head. After 23 years in power, Louis amassed great power, and he was the mad sponsor king. He was once quoted saying, all passports should require his approval. Louis wanted to reunite France, continuing as he had done in the, uh, continuing the unification since the Roman Empire. Dukes and barons fought regularly, and Louis XIV wanted a place where he could get everyone together. He had a grand vision to unite France. Versailles. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It started as a hunting lodge. It's an exemplar of Baroque French architecture, an exemplar of Italian architectural renaissance, and it became the seat of the monarchy. It's a beautiful building. It's an incredible space. Uh, there are 3,000 residents living there, uh, an opera house for 1,200 people. And this was the place where Louis could rule all barons and could be seen to rule. He even had zoo. Louis was a prickly character. He was jealous of his minister, Nicholas Fourchet, for example, and the splendor of his Chateau Vlacomte. Within three weeks of the chateau opening, Louis confiscated the estate on grounds of investment and it didn't work out well for Nicholas. So we enter our hero, Louis Laval, our architect hero. He was steeped in architectural renaissance and he was inspired by Baroque design. He started in 1661. Uh, for those of you in the project management field, could you imagine Louis as your sponsor? The sponsor, Mad King. Well, it started badly, but Louis did the right thing. He raised an early warning notice after two years in 1663. He reported dismay there had been high expenditure. Only the gardens had been finished. And I like to think, for those of you that are following, there was a poor CPI and SPI. But he did his job. He raised the risk. But it turned out badly. It turned out really badly. The whole thing cost £120 billion. Pounds. And we've just got to spare a thought here for our would-be hero, Jean-Baptiste, who is the superintendent of finances. Estimates varied, but that's a huge number. Can you imagine trying to get that past your accounts? It's a big number. He did push back on the cost. He pushed back to Louis. Maybe he raised an issue. Louis told him to find a way to make it happen. And according to leading research and mega projects today, about 47.5% of projects are on budget. But um, that's still a lot of money. HS2 and Crossrail, Buckingham Palace, all together. You could still get some change out of that. Or my favourite comparison, it can get you 100 Wembley football stadiums. Awful lot of money. Colbert could not have been happy with that state of affairs. But the positives, costs aside, Back to the impressive pictures of the science and fantastic hairdos. Projects can enable great benefits. When done right, they can create parties fit for a king. When they're really done right, they can have lasting legacies that go well beyond the original brief. The fact here is that we can see the side was used to sign the 1919 Treaty for World War I. Louis centralised his power in the site for 72 years, one of the longest in monarchs' history. But back to the negatives. 
benefits aren't everything. If you can't get one aspect of the Iron Triangle right, it can all go badly wrong. Louis was frequently meddling with the project and directing minute details. Builders made changes without any regard to cost, and Louis criticised the delivery frequently. This was a huge project, one of the most expensive of all time. It delivered great benefits, yes, and Louis will be remembered as a sun king god. He governed his man, uh, governed like a man with self-assured hubris. By his death in 1715, the government finances were in a state, and he was a man who wanted quality at any cost, but he failed to see the political risk of that. He and the sign became the backdrop to the French Revolution. Now, in summary, the sponsor was out of control. The would be God King, he had poor governance and assurance. For Jean Baptiste, he did try to govern the would be king. He was rife with change control, maybe uh, having the correct uh, cost control structure in place would have been good. Maybe he needed a commercial manager. But bear a thought for our would be hero, Jean Paul Baptiste, the finance member, manager. 47.5% of mega projects on budget today, according to Oxford, but only 0.5% deliver time, cost, and to benefits. So maybe it wasn't a success, or maybe JB just needed some 21st century Axelos reference class forecasting, some machine learning. That's what I've taken from the, the site. It was a disaster on time and cost, but architecturally revealed around the world. I challenge you to learn your lessons from this 350-year-old project and how to keep a level head. Thank you, everyone. That's my talk. Uh, so I've got no one to talk to now to hand over. This is really odd. As normally when I finish, there's someone for me to talk to, and I've not got anyone. Um, but I hope you enjoyed that talk. It's one I did back in February that coincided with National Storytelling Week. Um, it was a bit of a hero story. You may have noticed I tried to use good visuals, and uh, I actually watched a recording the other day of my first one of those. I used a lot of filler words, so I was trying to use space more and talk less. So that's my learning. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Right, let's go on now to the next speaker, and uh, I can stop talking for a little while. Um, so, uh, Paul, would you like to share your slides now? And uh, once, once, once done, um, we can come on. And I'm going to skip now the bits that you missed. Actually, that was the option you could have seen had you not chosen to see my talk. Great. Okay, I can see Paul shared his, his slide. So, um, Paul, if you could join us. Um, Paul is a recent master's um, project management graduate with a specialism in e-commerce and digital information. Paul is also a member of the Thames Valley Group and has been helping us with events. And we're really, really grateful to have you here, Paul, and for stepping up um, to, to do a talk. And, Paul, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Greg. Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody. So, Paul, I can confirm, I can see you on the screen, um, and I can see your, uh, your your presentation. There is a taskbar at the bottom, um, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we need to worry too much. Um, so, Paul, how, how, did you, how did you find putting all this together? You, uh, I, found it, I found it very exciting, very informative, and uh, just a pleasure to do. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, we're really grateful for you stepping up here and uh, you know, putting yourself in to do this challenge. And storytelling for, is for all of us, and we all have to practice. So I'm really excited to see your talk. Um, so, Paul, you can talk to us about risk management and short stories. Uh, I'm going to go off camera now, Paul, and hand over the floor. The floor is yours. So, risk management, a case study for the Thames Valley branch. Paul, oh, I'm just, I'm so sorry to do this. Yes. Your, your camera had frozen. Your camera had frozen. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt your flow, uh, but you might want to restart your camera, otherwise we'll, we'll go with your camera off if it freezes again. Okay. Technical gremlins. <laughs> always kind of on events. That should be, yeah, it's, it's on now, I think. I'm getting the black screen of, of uh, blackness there, Paul. So I'm going to suggest you just do this one with your camera off, maybe. 
and uh, we'll try okay. and get you back on later, later the Q and A. Okay. So, this presentation will define risk, risk management, give a worked example of a case study involving risk management, and to sum up a, a brief conclusion. So, risk. Risk is a factor which, with anything we do, has to be taken into account. No matter how small, no matter how big, it is a it is an issue that um, is important. And when we don't factor in risk, the consequences can be quite deadly, as we're going to see on the next slide. Uh, the Titanic is an example of when risk wasn't taken seriously enough and led to the sinking of the Titanic across the North Atlantic on its maiden voyage. If there had been a risk superhero, someone who was qualified in risk at the time, they would have pointed out that there wasn't enough lifeboats on the ship. And that proved to be an issue when the ship obviously was sinking to the Atlantic. There wasn't actually enough, there wasn't actually enough um, lifeboats on the on the ship which led to the tragedy so what is risk risk is an event which will have a positive or negative outcome on a project objective and so based on that it's important that we have a risk management system in place which can obviously define the risks and as we see on the next slide identify, analyze, evaluate, treat, and monitor. And obviously with evaluating the risks, you can rank risks with into what degree of severity the risk is on, on any given project uh, by using a risk register. Whereas we see here on a templated example of a risk register, you have the extremes of low, insignificant, right the way up to extreme catastrophic, which can lead to a project having to be abandoned. And the best example is obviously risk management. The best way to highlight it is uh, obviously through a case study, a presentation of a live project, which in this instance I've identified as the Farm and Belt Tunnel which links Germany with Denmark in Northern Europe. And this, this, this is a mega project. And this mega project has actually used software, um, computer software to help adapt the risk policy with the actual, any risks that can actually take part in the, in the project. And the advantage of it is with staff being trained on it, is that it can mean that staff project managers can obviously respond to risks in real time whereas before before computer software was used it would take longer for issues on projects i.e risk issues it would probably take longer slightly longer maybe a lot longer to identify the risks and this is an example of the predict software which all, all workers on the project were trained in using Welcome to Predict and it helped helped with the risk decisions on the project. And here we see the sort of issues, taking risks, treating risks positively. You had issues such as the dredging and you have the tunnel portal, you have the work harbour and this was from autumn last year. Uh, the, the leading a culture of effective risk management was adopted by tying the organisational values with risk effectiveness. So staff were trained and they could adapt in real times to when any potential risks could derail the project. So to conclude, Obviously, hundreds and ten years ago now, uh, this sort of 
computer software wasn't actually available. But with how project management and using computer software has evolved in the 21st century, it does go some way to reducing this event here from occurring where the Titanic hits the iceberg. Uh, that's all, folks. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Sorry, Greg. Uh, just to let you know you're on mute. That's never going to end, is it? <laughs> uh, Paul, thank you. Um, how did you find constructing this tool? Is it a new format for you? Yes, it was. It was a new format. It's been a little while since I've put a PowerPoint presentation together. But like I said before, it's been good to do and to re-familiarise myself with what I learned through the course of my studies. I really enjoyed it. And for everyone on the screen, by the same question before, like with Steve, I wonder if we can give Paul some constructive um, feedback. I'm, I'm going to ask you how, um, what do you think of the balance of the two case studies were, which I'm going to come back to, Paul, because I love the case studies and maybe if they came from your, your experience. And a question, should Paul put more focus on the Titanic or more focus on, Paul, can you pronounce this for me, the Farmbelt Tunnel? Yeah, the Farmbelt Tunnel in Denmark, when it links Germany with Denmark. Great. I've, I've not heard of that one before, but it's a lovely example. And I, I hadn't seen Predict either, so I was actually really interested to see that. And your ending, Paul, that, that really puts a smile on my face with, uh, OK, folks, see you later. I might have to plagiarise that one off you. <laughs> um, so we're asking people for some feedback. And um, we've had a few coming in. Um, so, Paul, I think we can see the screen. OK, a few more coming in. So the balance of the case studies pool, uh, that's coming in about 50. So maybe people feel actually um, some, some, some assessment level you could read from that. It could have gone one way or the other more. And people saying we should place maybe less emphasis on Titanic and more on the Far and Belt Tunnel. It seems people really like that. It's a case study. So there you go on your story structure pool. But it was great to see beginning, middle and end there, some lovely imagery. And you, you got me smiling at the end. So definitely worked for me. OK. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to ask you to go on mute now. And um, for everyone else on the call, um, in, the, in the closing minutes, that is a wrap on our talk. We've still got 70 people with us at the moment. So please do stick with me for just a couple of minutes as I've got a couple of exciting things to tell you about. And then I'll have a bit of a Q&A with Paul, myself and Steve, if anyone that's got any questions. Um, I, I, I would like to get some feedback from you as well. Uh, you know, I'm a volunteer. I've had a huge amount of time to run these events with others. I'm re really, really reliant on your feedback. Um, so if you've still got Mentee open and you could um, just, just quickly answer these two questions, that would really help us. Our objectives for today were to give you uh, learning, both in storytelling and from some of the sessions. And we just want to know, would you recommend it to anyone else? If you could fill that in for me, that would really help us um, with the time that we focus in the future. Um, but as, as, as we do that, um, Rob, Rob Allen, I've, 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 I think I've got a slight issue, Rob. Could, could, you just, could you just come on screen, Rob, for a second? Give me a hand. Robert Allen. You, you? Yeah, I'm coming on. Oh, hey, mate. Um, so I've got, I've got a slight issue, Rob. Today is your last day with the Association for Project Management. And... Sorry, Evan, this will take 30 seconds, but for those that don't know, Rob is the volunteer event manager for the APM. He's been with the APM for four years. And I honestly, Rob, can't thank you enough for all of your help supporting this event. This event would not have been possible for everyone's benefit without Rob. So, Rob, I uh, last night in true project management fashion fired out this word cloud at 7 o'clock. By 10 o'clock, I only fired out 20 people. By 10 o'clock, I had 13 responses. And, you know, the superlatives are there, Rob. Awesome comes out, helpful, amazing, enthusiastic. I mean, I did, I think I saw in there wasps. I have to say Gloucester, sorry. Um, but one of my personal favourite was an FA Oasis. Um, so, Rob, it was a bit sneaky me getting you on the screen. I know you weren't ready for this, but I just wanted to say thank you again for all of your help over the years. And I truly wish you all the best in the future. That's, that's, that's very kind of you, Greg. And, and thank you for everyone for the kind comments here. It really is a, a teamwork effort between uh, APM Branches team and all our wonderful volunteers. Uh, Greg, you give up all your time. Uh, Stephen Paul as well on this call, but there's a further 400-odd volunteers under the uh, APM uh, 
roof, if you like. Uh, it's a massive thank you to those, and I've had a great pleasure working with everyone over the last almost four years. So uh, thank you, and, and thanks everyone for coming along to these different webinars. So Greg, you've thoroughly embarrassed me enough. I'm going to uh, I'm going to quickly say uh, technology is against me, and my camera's breaking up, and I'll, I'm going to disappear. <laughs> that old chestnut. Thanks, Rob. Well, um, look, th th those comments, Rob, they were from the Thames Valley at people of the Event Collaboration Project. Um, so, yeah, thanks again, Rob. And, um, yeah, truly, you'll be, sorry, but I'm sure you'll be a complete success wherever you go in the future. Um, so, yeah, thank, thanks again, Rob. Okay, we've still got 60 odd people with us. So, um, closing remarks, I mean, great, fantastic feedback. Yes, we got a good score on the net promoter. Um, people took some good learning, but maybe there's a bit of work for us to do this. That's really positive. Thank you, everyone for your feedback there. Upcoming events, it would be remiss of me not to say this for the Thames Valley. And by the way, the two speakers today you've had were from the Thames Valley. There's an NEC framework contract session on September the 21st. We've had hundreds of people turning up to this. They're really good. And the speaker there is, is fantastic. Um, so do join those if you're interested. We're on the APM event stage. Starting your journey in project management, uh, that's an event for those new early careers. Um, do, do get along with that. I think there'll be some networking there. And uh, the big one I want to announce is um, hot, hot off the press. In, in April 2023, the Thames Valley will be running its first branch conference. It'll be a day conference, and there's going to be a huge, huge uh, opportunity for you all to attend. So it's likely going to be an iconic venue in either Oxford or Reading. The format will be there'll be some keynote speakers from the local area. But we're really trying to work on an objective to get higher education universities, corporates, and you, the members, talking to each other. How can research be improved? How can university courses be improved to give project managers the skills they need? So there's going to be learning, there's going to be collaboration, and there's going to be networking events, there's going to be events for those who are new to project management to uh, do career interviews, um, uh, practice and networking. So please do come on, keep an eye out for it. It's going to be an April, it's going to be a fantastic day, I promise you, and uh, do, do come along. Okay, um, so that, that brings us to the end, everyone. And I'm going to ask Paul and Steve if you can come back on the camera at this point. Um, we did open the opportunity for people to raise questions throughout in Menti. And I haven't seen any, so maybe I didn't make that clear enough for people who haven't used the tech. But there is an opportunity for anyone that's got any questions. Um, you, you can either type them into Menti and I'll bring them up here, uh, I think. Or uh, you can put them in the chat as well. I'll keep them out in the chat if that's easier for you. Um, if I can work out how to open Yes, I've got the chat open. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, please, please fire away. Uh, I think we've still got 56 people with us. Um, I don't. I don't think people can turn their cameras on, or if there's a hand up option, um, maybe maybe there is. I mean, Rob, if you could keep an eye on the hand up function, whatever works for you. Hand up, a mental question, or we'll put it in the chat. So, Steve and Paul, whilst we wait for any questions to come through, you can breathe a sigh of relief. That's the talk over. It was, it was a fun format, guys. It was a bit different to the one that we did last year. What, what do you think? Would you use a variant of this again in, in, in your day-to-day -day working life, Steve? It, it would depend very much on the context, I think, uh, Greg. Um, normally, I'm used to delivering hour-long lectures in front of an audience consisting of at least half a dozen professors and that sort of uh, level of uh, talk. But I can see business opportunities where you try to make a quick pitch because that's all the time you've got where you're trying to get something across very quickly and very succinctly, and where a story like this just brings people around, lets them see the essential points, and takes, takes home the, you know, the core you know, story. And I can see where that would work. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a real application here, isn't there, for getting a, a message across, engaging people, you know, explaining an investment case. I've used the Spark clients recently to do that, where I took the, the investment panel from where they were now, the problem, to where they could be, and then link that to a solution, and that really works. Well, you, you know the, the old adage of the, you know the elevator pitch. You walk into a, like a company's offices, you're in the elevator, and you realise you've got the CEO to yourself for 30 seconds. What do you say? 
And so that sort of context where you've got 10 minutes or seven minutes to tell somebody important about your ideas, your, your, your concepts, your project, whatever it is, and you've got seven minutes. You can't get into the nitty gritty. It just isn't time. But you can tell a story. You can you can sell the, uh, the schmaz, if you like, and just get uh, somebody on board by listening to your story. And that's where this is really, really powerful. Agreed. Yeah, that ability to con create a story and frame it quickly when asked a question, it's a really, really good skill set. Um, so I, I, I've actually, um, I, 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 you know, there's lots of options for people. I think we've got a question actually that's come through. So um, I'm going to share my screen again. I'm, I'm hoping you can see Menti on the screen again. Now I can't tell. There we go. Yeah, great. So I just had a question come through for everyone. I can see huge benefit in using storytelling for lessons learned dissemination. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a good use case, I think, Steve. Cool. Yes. I think, Paul, that's very much like your case study, isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah. So the question being, what top tips do you have for this? So what top tips do you have for using storytelling to uh, to disseminate lessons learned? Paul, do you want to go first? Your thoughts? Yes, I, I I would I would basically just say that. If it's short and to the point, with a look of in, with a bit of imagery with it, that would obviously leave a sort of impression on whoever's viewing the presentation. Uh, that that's the sort of secret. I would that would be how I would remember a storytelling presentation. Sure. Yeah, that's something about attention span, isn't that? Pool of people. I, I can't remember the old adage. Is, Steve, you may know seven to thirteen minutes, isn't it? If you haven't got your message across in that time, you're not going to. If you're lecturing to university students, about five minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, you, you, you've really got to get, you've really got to grab people's attention in the first five minutes. If not, you've lost them for the next ten, ten or twenty. There's a theory here around um, event management. It's called the spike. So in the opening, there's actually something around thirty seconds. In the first thirty seconds, you really need to catch people's attention. That's partly why I use the big "Where are you in the world?" because it's quite attention grabbing. But you know, I would I would say. Opening is really important. Like going back to storytelling theory, whoever asked this. So think about think about your objective. Think about your audience. And what story journey do you want to take them on? Open, open well. Open with a question. Open with a shocking statement. Open with a fact. That's really going to get people to draw in at the beginning. But yeah, I think I think my 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 feedback on this one would be think about your story structure. Go back to those techniques we talked about. I agree with Paul. Keep it short. Uh, Steve, anything else you want to add on this one? Well, just to say, to, to make sure you use really good graphics or images if you can. I mean, I'm, I was very impressed with Paul's images of the Titanic. And, you know, so it grabs the attention, grabs the urgency of the situation. And in, in my case, I tried to do my best using uh, multi-million graphic, um, graphics from NASA. You know, you, you can't fake those photographs of satellites in orbit. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's just a, a real eye catcher that just grabs the attention. So that's, that's amount of time. Think about your story structure and good imagery. And uh, oh, I would add to that as well. Do do um, reference your imagery. Uh, you can get caught out by not not citing where you got it from. Um, use some um, top tip here. Go on Google and there's a setting in there which you can click for search called Creative Commons only. Basically, that means you can use the images free without having to cite them. Or maybe you do, but you just say it's open open source. Uh, okay, uh, we do have another question, so let's have a look at that one. Thank you, chaps. Um, have the speakers used or considered tools other than PowerPoint, um, e.g. storytelling apps like Microsoft Sway? Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to you Paul, on that one. I, I feel like you may be a bit more familiar with uh, any latest technology, maybe from university or similar. Have you, have you got any thoughts on different storytelling techniques? So I haven't used I haven't used Microsoft Sway before, so I'll go and investigate that. It sounds quite good. I, I've only been using PowerPoint, so yeah, I, 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 uh, I I'll uh, go and check out Microsoft Sway. It's the first time I've heard of it. <laughs> Steve, any thoughts on this one? Well, again, like Paul, uh, I'm a bit of a uh, dinosaur in IT terms. Um, um, I haven't heard of Microsoft's way like, like Paul, 
but uh, yeah, I, I'd be open to using anything that uh, sensibly works with, with the medium. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen Sway. I've never actually tried to use it in anger. Um, but, you, you know, you don't have to have a PowerPoint. I mean, the key, the key point about story is structure and the person telling the story. What you can see on screen is my presentation aid. That's a presentation aid. If we were in a room together, I wouldn't be dominating you with a big, big screen, would I? I'd be much closer to you. So you, you can use whatever you want for your aid. You know, use paper. Um, one, one client I've worked for, they don't want us to, they just want to see the Word document of the report. So we have to tweak the report to make the exact summary basically like a presentation. Um, the Mentimeter, that's good. You saw that today. You're looking at it right now. You can use that as a tool. And that has, that has engagement built into it as well. And that's also a key point to try and uh, get that to make communication going. Okay, I hope that helps. Uh, we've got another one. Um, oh, some lessons learned. Okay, sorry. Okay, oh, that was a that was a test. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing many other questions. If anyone does want to raise any, you can either put it in the chat, put your hand up. I think maybe Robert, tell me if you've got that, or you can put it in Menti. Um, we've still got forty odd people on the line, um, which is which is great. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, so I guess uh, maybe closing thoughts. Um, Steve, and anything you want to add? Well, simply to encourage people to do this kind of stuff. You know, it's a bit of an adventure. Um, like all presentations, it takes a little bit of, um, you know, getting ready for, a bit of drama and uh, excitement on the day, the adrenaline starts running. Um, and it's just a, a jolly useful thing to do, actually, to, to add this technique to your skill set so that come the day when you want to use it, you know, out, out in practice to a real client or in, in support of a real project, then it's at your fingertips, and I, I would certainly endorse it. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, pra practice, practice. Um, in every opportunity you have. Uh, I can see we've got another question, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick zero the last one. I'm going to try and check again. Here we go. Uh, are there any good sources that pull together lessons learned from different industries that you would recommend? It's slightly off the, uh, the, the the topic, but a good question. Um, Steve, do you, want to, do you want to have a go? Not, not that I'm aware of, Greg. Um, you could possibly do a trawl through some of the project management journals and things like that and ask for um, you know, questions like, uh, you can do Google Scholar or something like that, looking for these sorts of lessons, but I'm not aware of any answers to that question. Sorry. Anything you'd like to add? I would say maybe the body of knowledge, you know, the, the fourth edition. I mean, I've I've read that, and there are examples from different mm. industries and what have you to do with projects. So the body of knowledge, or maybe APM, the actual website. Yep, there's, there's definitely I've seen that quite a bit in both. Um, for, and I, I would add, um, have, have a look at Crossrail Learning Legacy. That's a good one, really good one actually. I mean, I sort of didn't quite deliver, but it was a really good project. Um, and they spent a lot of money doing a learning legacy website. So have, have a look at that. Uh, freedom of information requests. Um, it's good to do if you really want to get into it. Um, there is a knowledge special interest group within the APM. Go on APM, go on communities, have a look at what they do. Reach out to the chair. It's something I spoke to him about a while ago, actually. It's something he wants to do a lot more of in the APM. Create, you know, turn the APM less about being publishing and more into about knowledge capture and dissemination. I agree with him. So um, you know, find out who the chair is for that. For that, uh, single reach out to me. And why don't you take leadership from us? Whoever raised the question, and make that happen. We'd all benefit from it. Okay. Next question. I hope that helped. Um, may I ask? Uh, when are we having Laura Hartley? Ah, okay. Um, I, th I think she's holed up in bed at the moment, so I haven't asked her that question. Um, there's no there's no plan at the moment to, to get her back in, but I'll, uh, I'll certainly ask the question. And um, maybe maybe we'll do another one of these friends. We usually give about eight to 12 weeks marketing time. Um, so if, if the Thames Valley pick this up again, I'll, uh, I'll, let, I'll let you know. But yeah, it, it, may, it may be eight to 12 weeks that she's up for it. Uh, 
Uh, it's quite a great slide. I did see them. So it's a real ship, Chicago. Uh, okay. Um, right. Um, still got lots of people on the line. Um, let's find a few more minutes for game. Any closing remarks from you? Your video is frozen as well, though, for lunch and Is it me? I see Gremlins very happy again. Oh, I can hear you. <laughs> no, I've, I've, I've enjoyed it today and um, doing the storytelling. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a uh, learn for me. It, it's fun, as I remember doing my first one a year ago. Like Steve said, my heart was pounding at the beginning. And I learned a lot. I've learned so much from trying to do these events. It's drastically changed how I do my storytelling. Mm -hmm. Great, great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, in hindsight, you can smile. Um, so no, no other questions. Um, I think closing remarks from me. Um, echo Steve's, I think, practice. Find every opportunity to practice. The next time you have to do a presentation, think about story structure. Google it. Google story structures. Pick one. Go for it. I think Spark Lines is fantastic. Second, watch... Death by PowerPoints by J.P. Phillips. Honestly, I watched it about a year and a half ago in preparation for my first talk on this. Completely changed how I do presentations. That's Death by PowerPoints by J.P. Phillips on YouTube. Best 15 minutes, I highly recommend. So practice J.P. Phillips. And um, yeah, just look, look for different sources as well. Um, you know, I, I, I'm trying to practice. I've joined the Toastmasters, actually if none of you have heard of that before, but that is a group where you get together and you practice speaking. And it's fantastic. And if anyone's interested, pop in a message or just sign up. I can't recommend it highly enough. Yeah, practice, practice, practice. Think about your story structure. There's another two from me. Okay, uh, looking at the screen, I don't think we've got any others. Um, Steve and Paul, I think we should call it there. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you both. Thank you again for everyone who joined. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.